Welcome to today's podcast on the science of social justice with special guest, Dr. Sarah King. We're so honored to have her here with us today. A reminder that this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Dr. Sarah King is a mother, a neuroscientist, a political and learning scientist, medical anthropologist, social entrepreneur, public speaker, and certified yoga and meditation instructor. Dr. King specializes in researching and teaching about the relationship between mindfulness, community alternative medicine, and social justice with an emphasis on examining the relationship between individual and collective awareness as it relates to well being. She is the founder of Mind Heart Consulting, an NIH postdoctoral fellow in neurology at Oregon Health Sciences University in the Oregon Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine and Neurological Disorders. And she is a core team member of Mobius, a nonprofit supporting compassion in tech. She's also the director of science and community engagement for the Embodied Social Justice Certification Program. Thank you so much for being here with us, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> All of that sounds like I, I never eat or sleep. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much for the kind introduction. The intention of today's podcast is to learn more about Dr. King and her work in social justice, mindfulness, and yoga. Ultimately, we hope that this episode will inspire you to become an agent of change towards social justice in the world. We hope you'll discover what social justice is and how important it is to include it in your own life. Takeaways from today are that you can also help prioritize social justice in all social and professional frameworks. So, Sarah, can you share with us your story of how you became involved in this important work within social justice and then how that melded together with your own personal practice of mindfulness and yoga and your expertise in that? Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for asking. Um, you know, really, it has been uh, a lifelong journey of learning how to incorporate all the many different aspects of my live experience into uh, my now expertise in what I do. And so, you know, something that I think that some people may be a little bit surprised about is that in my childhood, I grew up experiencing a lot of uh, chronic houselessness and housing insecurity. Uh, and that experience, for those of you who have not necessarily experienced what it is like to, you know, have to pack up what little belongings that you may have and, and literally run away from a sheriff's office who is coming to kick you out of your home and you don't know where you're going to go. I mean, when we talk about the, the stress response and adverse childhood experiences, right, that really is very alive inside of my body. Um, you know, I had to live with my mother oftentimes inside of battered women's shelters and uh, motel rooms. Um, and the thing is about living in uh, shelters and hotel rooms is that you don't necessarily have an address where you can be on file so that you can go to a school. So there were many periods of time in my life I don't know. I think I probably attended between 10 and 13 different schools before I got to high school. And then there would be like gap periods of time where I wasn't in school at all. I mean, we can't get in trouble for this now. Right. But it was very important for my mom um, to kind of like hide the fact that we didn't have a real address so that the, 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 the authorities wouldn't get involved and take me away from her. So when she was out looking for work, she would take me to a local public library and literally just sit me in there as a kid and say, don't talk to strangers. Here's a snack. Read whatever you want all day, right? Now, at first, it was a little bit terrifying because you can imagine me, you know, I'm, I'm six, seven, eight years old. I'm just like a tiny little thing all by myself somewhere inside of like a massive uh, public library. But for me, I like to say that that was really the beginning of developing my inner medical anthropology eyes in a type of way, because um, number one, 
you really have to become very sensitive to your surroundings and how people are behaving in their various states of health and well-being to keep yourself safe in that situation. I also had access to the library stacks and I was very motivated for whatever reason. And I would just literally spend eight to 12 hours a day reading everything that I could get my hands on and stuff that was like way beyond my age range. So in a way, it was a course of really intensive self-study for me. And I think that also, um, you know, I found myself noticing the fact that number one, libraries are places of refuge for the houseless, right? So I wasn't alone in that situation. And I really had a lot of time to uh, sit and perceive, okay, what are the different types of people who are coming to this library space and for why? And I started to notice um, class differences, right? And little things like um, how people are dressed and who has a car and who has food, um, because these were things that I did not have. So I did not take things like having a car or food or clothing or a place to go to school for granted. And I really noticed the ways in which our experience of class or race or gender really begin to stratify access to those kinds of resources. And these were realizations that dawned on me from an exquisitely early age. And I would also say that I was very aware of how many of uh, my family members, as well as people in, in my community, in the, in the African-American community, especially in a lot of my family were uh, living in the Crenshaw district of Los Angeles. Um, so I would fly back and forth all over the country, but during the summers, I would usually spend it with them. And I really notice the prevalence with which Black and Brown men in my family, in my community, were experiencing uh, police brutality and were being incarcerated compared to my peers for whom, um, you know, if, if they did not come from uh, an African-American or a Latino background, they didn't necessarily have a lot of family members who were encountering this kind of really violent and horrific treatment on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, and and and, you know, just quite frankly, a lot of people from my community, I, I almost don't know of anyone who hasn't literally lost a cousin, a brother, an uncle uh, to some form of police or gang violence, right? So as a child, you really start taking this information in. And I was asking myself a lot of questions like, well, why is it that when you look this way, you're subject to this kind of treatment? But when you look that way, you are somehow protected from that. And I think that these kinds of thoughts that I was having, along with having attended King Drew Medical Magnet High School in Los Angeles, I don't know if uh, anybody listening to this is familiar with King Drew, uh, the hospital. Uh, but when you go to that high school, you actually have an opportunity to intern one day a week at the hospital. So I had a lot of experience within the biomedical field from having interned there for several years. And I really saw firsthand the way that people's experience of class and race could potentially have a very grave impact on the, the quality and type of treatment that they were receiving inside of the space. Um, and so all of that is to say that by the time I got to undergrad and I went to undergrad at Pitzer College and Pitzer College is a place where they're all about social justice. It was just like the perfect melting pot experience for me to take all of my lived experience and my educational experience and these germinating thoughts and ideas that I had around, you know, what was really present for me was, okay, I want to be a healer, but what kind and I didn't really know how to answer that question. Um, I think that I was very aware that I had a lot of um, emotional and psychological and physical pain inside of my body that I was carrying. And I tried to go to therapy for a number of years. And it, it still, it felt like the suffering that I was experiencing was so intense, it was so acute. Um, I actually really suffered from um, 
from a chronic, really severe anxiety and depression. And later on in graduate school, I was actually diagnosed with PTSD. But this is to say that the talk therapy that I was experiencing, um, I felt like it was getting me part of the way there in terms of my healing, but I really felt like something needed to shift on a cellular level. And it wasn't until I was 21 and I uh, started my, my master's program at UCLA that a couple of friends uh, started guiding me towards yoga and meditation practices. And I have to say that, um, <laughs> you know, in that first yoga class that I took, I hated it. <laughs> It was terrible. <laughs> and I wanted to like cuss at the instructor because everything inside of my body was screaming with so much pain. And I thought like, I can't even sit cross-legged. Like, how am I supposed to do this downward dog for more than two seconds? Um, but then I, I have this very visceral memory of being in Shavasana at the end of the class. And these feelings of like peace and calm coming over my body that I'd never experienced in my entire life. And as I lay there on the mat experiencing that, I think that was the first time in the back of my mind, I started to think, well, if someone like me from my background with my lived experience, right, with um, the mental health issues that I was encountering and the real chronic pain that I was trying to heal from, if I can experience this peace and calm in my body, then what can it do for my community who are really suffering in a lot of the same ways that I am? And they're looking for reprieve and they're not necessarily being able to find it. So I think that's kind of how I would describe that path in a nutshell. So I'm a yoga teacher also, and I just, this idea of the shifts on a cellular level and how that can change how we experience things like anxiety and depression and all kinds of, um, I'm not trained in trauma-based trauma yoga, but all kinds of traumas that we've experienced, whether micro or macro, and that um, I think you're right that I think sometimes we think, um, you know, it can heal anything and we can use all kinds of different modalities. And this idea that there are so many ways to be a healer. And so we can heal, many of our listeners are physicians, but that there are so many ways to heal outside of the exam room as well. And so I love this idea of bringing it to social justice and bringing it to healing our communities and all of these divisions that we have between ourselves. And I do think that when we heal ourselves, we can show up better to heal and connect everyone else. And so that may be a bit of the yoga piece to me as we get out of that tension and anger and frustration and all of the language about how it should be. And we get tapped back into our humanity on that really cellular level. I mean, there's so many things that this has brought up, but I think to me, that's what, what comes right now and that we can all experience that peace and calm if we let ourselves. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, one thing that really landed for me because, uh, you know, initially during my graduate studies, I I wasn't necessarily focusing on, uh, you know, looking at yoga and meditation interventions, but uh, I was invited um, to a research group at UCLA at the David Geffen School of Medicine. And there were some scientists there in the cardiology department who were developing a mindfulness-based uh, intervention specifically for cardiologists to see if teaching these clinicians a mindfulness practice and having them implement it before going into a room with a post-operative heart transplant patient, if it actually impact, impacted um, the health and the well-being of the patient. And from that study, they actually started seeing that the patients had far less of a chance of rejecting that heart transplant, and they lived for a greater duration of time after the operation specifically with the cardiologist who implemented this mindfulness practice. And so that was deeply fascinating, right? Because they're literally just doing like two or three minutes of practice outside of the patient's door before they go in. And one of the things that the patients reported was that even though they only had maybe five or 10 minutes with that actual clinician or practitioner, they experienced them being 
um, so present. It was the presence of the doctor and how that shifted where they felt greater trust. They felt more seen. They felt that the doctor was exhibiting greater compassion and connectedness to their experience. And they actually reported that they perceived the length of time that the doctor was in the room to be longer than it actually was. There was an experience of time dilation. And so when I had that first um, clinical research experiencing setting of the power of mindfulness practices to shift patient care, I mean, that was when it, it, it changed everything in my educational trajectory because I thought, well, if doctors and nurses are capable of this, what about our teachers? And what about our social workers? And, you know, it just sort of started expanding in, in circles of how I was envisioning authentic care from that. So Ra, I just wanted to reflect on just the richness and also to thank you for being vulnerable and open in sharing your, your story on just reflecting upon the interdependence of how our past can influence so greatly how we show up for ourselves and for each other. And then how when we show up with presence for ourselves and for those that we are trying to heal, like that is how our society, how the world will heal is how we show up. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. There, there really is so much power um, in how we learn how to slow down and connect to ourselves. And I, I really feel very passionately about this idea of, you know, well, how can we who are in the field of health and well-being make these practices as accessible as possible? Because if I'm going to be honest, a lot of the feedback that I got uh, during my PhD program when I was really looking at youth of color who were engaged in learning yoga and meditation practices is that there was a lot of um, resistance that I think was, was actually... Um, you know, very understandable. There was a lot of um, resistance around, well, we think these practices, they sound like something very elite. They sound like something very lofty and inaccessible. And, oh, do I have to go get like a whole outfit and then find a studio? And, oh, there's no studio in my community. So then that means that I have to travel. And when I go to those places of practice, I'm not expecting that the people who are there are going to be understanding of my particular lived experience of suffering. So there's all these kinds of like stories and cognitive barriers that can arise before a person even gets to the place of deciding, you know what, I'm going to go anyway. And so I think that that's also something um, that can be addressed inside of the medical community in particular. And that reminds me, one of our very first podcast episodes was on mindfulness for all and trying to figure out how to make it accessible. And I do think that's one of the really beautiful things about the pandemic is that um, I now teach yoga online and to mostly physicians and healers on the weekends. And I have people from all over the world that join because they can, and it's free online. And so you do need to have internet. I will say that. So maybe the public library has internet, but a lot of cities have internet and I know there's, you know, that doesn't include everyone, but it's much more inclusive than having to get to a yoga studio and to feel comfortable in a yoga studio. And it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. And I think some of these tools can just happen sitting anywhere once you learn them. And so to me, it's figuring out how we can share them more broadly. I'm a pediatrician by training. So I think if we share them with young people and make them cool and hip for young people, then they carry through the rest of their life. And we did talk about that in a previous podcast as well. But I just this idea of how we can make it more accessible and perhaps change people's perception of it. And so this concept, though, that it's helpful to everyone and um, we can bring this sense of peace and calm no matter where you are and no matter what's happening within. I often think about like mindfulness and breathing is something we can do anywhere in the hospital, except perhaps in the ICU if you're unconscious or, you know, but really it can be brought to anyone to change how they experience the world. And so how can we think about this? Um, another thing you brought up was just incarceration. And I'm thinking it would help with that too. <laughs> like at least you can go somewhere in your mind um, 
not solving the the front end problem, but making the experience um, less onerous. So I'm curious, um, Ni Cheng talked about the science of social justice, and I'm wondering what that is. And um, it sounds amazing. So I'd love to hear more. Yeah, absolutely. And that 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 actually relates to. Um, you know, what you're talking about in terms of uh, accessibility. So the science of social justice, my research framework is meant to be incredibly deeply inclusive. And what I like to say is, if you have a body, you deserve well-being, period. That's your access point, right? And so I say that in order to kind of get at lovingly disrupting this idea that well-being is something that you get when you're very wealthy or you're very privileged or when you come from a certain racial background, it's like, no, the body is the starting ground. Um, and the central theoretical tenet around the science of social justice is that social justice and well-being are one and the same thing. And the way that I approached this was, um, you know, I really started asking myself in graduate school questions. I had a lot of questions around, uh, for instance, the persistence of racism in, in, in our society in the United States. Why? Why is it so persistent? When we have these phenomenal academic institutions available to us and the most brilliant minds who are working on this, and we've been talking and talking and talking about it for like over 400 years, and yet schools are more segregated today than they were in the 1970s. Then when you look at prison populations and the, way, and the manner in which they are experiencing segregation, right? It's like, obviously this issue is incredibly endemic. And the thinking that I got led to was like, okay, this isn't a cognitive problem. We're not gonna think our way out of this. We're not just gonna talk our way out of this. We've got to find a way of getting into the body and how this feels, right? An embodied form of education. And that led me to think, well, what are the kinds of interventions that exist that attend to the body and the mind and relationships? And that is what led me to the biopsychosocial model of medicine and the interventions that we see that are most effective for attending, attuning towards this biopsychosocial model of health and well being are yoga and meditation interventions because they are really producing physiological changes inside of the body, right? When, when we're talking about um, structural and functional, functional brain changes and shifts in inflammation inside of the body, they are really producing shifts in our mental health and our psychology. And then those two together are changing the way that we are in relationship with one another. So I really think that if we look at all of the fields that that study and attend to well-being, neuroscience, psychology, psychiatry, medicine, public health, all of those, right? And we see the ways in which they combine their approaches to well-being for the physiology, for our mental health, for our relationships. To me, that is the path to social justice right there because it's based in the body and you know, some people, you know, have come to me and said, oh, you know, that term social justice, I don't know, like, that's gonna, that's gonna make certain people feel some kind of a way, and they're gonna feel like they don't have access to it, and like, oh, I'm not a social justice warrior, like, I'm not gonna get out in the streets and, you know, be, you know, they have this, like, very, like, uh, I think, occasionally narrow association with, like, social justice being about protesting in the streets, and, and that is what that is, that is what that looks like. So in, in my research, I have actually flipped the script a little bit and I take a look at that word justice, I isolated it. And I say to me, justice is loving awareness in action. I'll say it again, justice is not something punitive. It's not about how we punish each other and put each other down and enact violence and you know, put a certain population away in prisons in order to keep ourselves safe and blah, 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 right? No, it's loving awareness in action. And so when we are grounding our actions in love and what that means, right? Loving kindness and forgiveness and compassion. And we are talking about our power to be aware, 
awareness is a capacity that is arising from the experience of being human, our ability to like perceive ourselves in this world. And then what is social? Well, social is all about interdependence. It's about our shared interbeing. So when we study the kinds of actions that put forward loving awareness in the world, to me, that is the path of social justice. That is what all of my research is really examining, and especially the ways in which mindfulness and contemplative practices like yoga are very uniquely suited for bringing about these states of loving awareness inside of the body and for operationalizing them in our actions and the way we treat ourselves in the world. And so I would say that that's really what the science of social justice is about. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that as I have been uh, talking and lecturing about this really around the world now, it really seems to strike a chord because I think people globally are really, they're really tired of the divisiveness that they're experiencing in society. People are very acutely aware because of COVID-19 about how much we are collectively suffering. And we're experiencing collective trauma and there's, there's intergenerational trauma, right, that we're attempting to deal with too. And I think that people are really tired of the violence that we're seeing globally, co collectively, towards ourselves. If we want to look at what's happening right now, you know, like in Ukraine is like a profound example about how we're all deeply impacted by violence as it occurs. And in, and in all the places that are experiencing war and violence, and then there's also the violence that's being done to the planet and how that's really deeply impacting us in our suffering. So I think that when people hear these words, oh, loving awareness, loving awareness in action, that really shows them that the path to how to change the world is inside of them. And perhaps the next question um, will tie in really nicely with the depth of the loving awareness that you just covered is this model that you created called the systems-based awareness map. Can you tell us more about that framework? Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, um, as a research scientist, it's, it's incredibly, um, communication is incredibly important, right? And so the science of social justice, it started out as this theoretical framework that I was exploring um, you know, by really looking particularly at yoga and mindfulness practices that are being taught through the lens of social justice. And then I realized, you know what, um, people need a visualization. They need something to look at that can crystallize all of these ideas into a single image. So the systems-based awareness map, it is a theoretical map of the relationship between our internal individual awareness and our external and collective awareness. So all of the, you know, how is it that we can have a visual and really map out this relationship between all the thoughts and feelings and emotions and sensations that are happening inside of my body, um, how I'm experiencing my identity inside of myself and how my identity is really impacted by um, my epigenetics or my experience of intersectionality. How about, how can we map the relationship between all of that and my experience of health and well-being or disease, right? And inside of the brain, we have this function, interoception, right? Or interoceptive awareness that allows us to map, create a map of our internal landscape. How it is that I'm feeling on the inside? And then that is connected to exteroception, right? Or my exteroceptive awareness. How do I know? How can I feel the quality of the information and the stimuli that's coming to me from outside of the world, right? But then beyond that, right, in this experience of having an individual and single body with a single nervous system, I explore this concept of the collective nervous system. So what happens when two or more of us just like right here, the three of us are making a collective nervous system experience and we are sharing, communicating all of this information between our nervous systems together. How do we map that information 
and then actually relate that to what is happening in our environment, in society, in culture, how do we do that? That's what this map explores. And I think one of the things that is really beautiful about where my, where my work has um, evolved is initially I thought, oh, I'm going to create mindfulness meditation practices so that people can like really work with this as a tool for visualizing this relationship between themselves and the world. And then I realized that um, because of how much trauma a lot of people are holding in their bodies, mindfulness practices are not necessarily appropriate for everyone, right? So then, or, or because of this like barrier of this perception of like how, you know, kind of wafty and out there it is. So I started looking at research in neuroaesthetics, the neuroscience of aesthetics and art. And I saw that um, when we, there's, there's, a, there's a new field of, of research looking at when we are viewing figurative or abstract art, there is something about that. We don't really know what, um, but the brain perceives that art as happening inside of us. It doesn't necessarily tell the difference between like, I'm standing here and this art is out there. We actually experience it as though we were making the art ourselves. And we feel the colors and the light and the sensations as though they're in occurring inside of the body. And this can have a profound result in terms of, for instance, re reducing cortisol production inside of the body, right? And so then there was like a whole aha that happened for me where I thought, oh, okay, um, perhaps if I combined um, looking, slow looking and listening to art, abstract and figurative art um, with an ambient musical soundscape that is designed to bring us into relationship between the presence and the absence of sound. So the presence and absence of light and color and sound, and then I combine that with somatic instructions. Would this bring about an experience of the contemplative for people who are engaging with the map? And that's exactly the program that I launched with the Museum of Modern Art in New York called Art and Awareness as a Catalyst for Healing. And, uh, and I debuted that just a couple of weeks ago and, and it was an absolutely wonderful experience. And this is your second collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art. It's my third. It's my oh, third. Oh, it's your third, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations, so, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so Amazing. much. There is, um, if you go, if you go to the MoMA New York right now, there is a work of art called Black Girl's Window that is up right now. And I've recorded a meditation that you can listen to. It's inside of the museum. And it leads you on an experience of um, learning about my research with the science of social justice. And it's a meditation on the art. And then uh, the second collaboration was called The Art and Science of Hope and Justice with Dr. Dan Siegel. Uh, and then the third collaboration just debuted last week. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing their, your artistry and melding that in this like multi-sensorial experience. And I think uh, when we were talking about accessibility, this is yet another way where this work can be accessible and truly it allows the participants the onlookers the the people that we are trying to reach um, to really meet them where they're at mm -hmm. exactly and we'll put links for more about those in the uh, show notes because i think people will be really interested in learning more excellent so a final question for you, which is that most of our listeners are healthcare professionals. Is there anything specific around the mindfulness yoga interplay between social justice? And to me, this interplay of trauma too, because I think in medicine, we experience trauma and many of our patients have experienced trauma. And how can we um, bring all of that together? Is there any advice you would have for us in our work to be more effective in the social justice realm and in our lives? Yeah, I mean, um, what comes to me from the top of my mind in this moment is that people's experience of identity is really important. And finding out how people identify, right, 
is really important in terms of understanding the kinds of discrimination that they may be facing on a day-to-day -day basis. There is a really deep connection, actually, biologically speaking, between people's experience of chronic pain and chronic stress and perceived discrimination, perceiving themselves to being discriminated against is actually causally linked to the experience of chronic pain inside of the body. And so I think that, you know, and, and, and again, I, I say this with so much like humility because I, I'm, a, I'm a PhD, I'm not an MD. And so that means I'm an interventionist. Uh, so I'm more working with MDs a lot of the time to ask questions around how to create spaces of healing. And I'm not having that direct intersection um, with the physical body. Um, but I think that this can, number one, this, this realization can give us a lot of empathy um, and it can give us a lot of compassion, right? Just from jump. I think that the way that people experience individual trauma, collective trauma and intergenerational trauma is very different based on their experience of identity as well. And that's something that we can really take into account when we are building treatment plans um, and accessing, you know, well, like, what is the most authentically caring and compassionate form of relationality I can offer up in this, like, patient-clinician interaction? Because I think that when we ignore the role of identity in the treatment of trauma, there is a whole part very in part of a person and their experience of awareness that gets ignored. And that can really um, exacerbate the potential for harm to be done. So when we're thinking about harm reduction, right? Because we're humans and we're fallible and there's no way that we're not gonna like trip up. Um, I think that when we, when we keep the role of identity in mind and we're opening ourselves up to opportunities to learning more about how different people from different uh, racial and cultural and religious and ethnic and gender, et cetera, et cetera, backgrounds, how they experience their identity and we make the space for them to express, this is my experience of pain or discomfort. And we can actually open up the space to begin to connect how that experience of pain or discomfort might be related to their identity that can be incredibly empowering for the patient in terms of how they are truly feeling seen and heard in that context. And also just like the amount of safety, emotional safety that they're experiencing. Um, because, you know, and I can just say this from my own personal lived experience, when you're in pain or discomfort and you're suffering, it's such a vulnerable place to be in. So disorienting and disempowering and we can, sort of lose our capacity to um, put language to our experience effectively unless we're given that compassionate opportunity by the person who's attempting to provide some relief. One thing I just wanted to comment on was what you said, chronic pain and stress and having experienced discrimination are linked because I think many times along the way, we're taught in medicine that there's like a, like you have to find the physical cause. And if you don't find the physical cause, maybe they're not in pain. And I think we've grown in that evolution for sure, since I did my training. But um, I think just having that in your mind, like chronic pain and stress are here for many reasons and discrimination is one of them. And I think that um, we would all be better doctors if we immediately thought about that. And maybe we don't even know what discrimination it is. Um, we don't know where these people, where our patients and are, are coming from. We don't know their background. And so you mentioned this concept of curiosity, which I thought was super powerful. Like, could we just show up with mindful curiosity? And I had one other um, just quick question about the identity. So as physicians, we're always, of course, short on time. And so, and so I almost hate to ask the question, but I'm being practical and realizing that, say, I work with a lot of ER physicians as a physician coach and their interactions are short and I'm a prim primary care pediatrician. So we have 15 minutes. And so how do we get at that identity in, to me, it has to be authentic in an authentically easeful way to sort of open, just create the space or allow it to be there or allow someone to feel comfortable to say something. I don't, 
that may be a really challenging question, but I, I just want to throw it out there. Yeah, well, it is, this is all so challenging and complex, but I, I do think that there are some simple solutions and uh, I feel really fortunate to, uh, to be a research scientist working in a hospital. And so I feel like I, I've gotten by osmosis <laughs> a lot of experience of um, you know, what it is that clinicians encounter and what tools they are using to develop relationships with patients. That relationship space is of such great importance when we're considering what it means to heal. And so, um, you know, sometimes there are certain protocols that clinicians are taught, right, in terms of like, uh, okay, you're not just sort of going in there empty handed with what language you're going to use to approach the patient, right? So we can be mindful about how we are looking at the protocols that we are using to engage with patients. And we can ask ourselves questions around like, it, does this protocol touch upon questions around what community this person has come from, right? And if, if it's just giving you, you know, if I, if I come into a doctor's office and I just tell you, oh, you know, um, I'm from Long Beach, California. Well, that's going to give you a little bit of information, right? But there's a deeper level of questioning that you can engage in in order to get at someone's community experience in order to um, understand the kinds of day-to-day -day challenges and experiences they may be encountering that could really contribute to their experience of chronic stress. Like, are they living in a food desert? Do, do they have easy access to the kinds of nutrition that is necessary to support their health and well-being, right? You can get at that by asking targeted questions about their community environment, by gently asking questions about their work environment, or even um, childcare is huge, right? Especially in terms of the kinds of stresses that that places on a, a, on a person's um, home environment. Um, and there is a lot of really incredible literature out there that is pertaining to like the cultural and ethnic and like racial identities of people from different backgrounds and how it is that they might receive what it is that you have to offer them differently on the basis of their background. So it does take a little bit of time to read up and to research, but you can also gain that just by being in conversation with people and I think another thing that I would say about, and this is grounded in this concept of loving awareness and action, I think that the quality of listening that we engage in when we speak is super important. And there is a difference between talking at someone. There's a qualitative felt difference in that. And we tend to talk at people more when we're stressed out. Because we're like, I just got to get this information out there. It's like, da, 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 da. and there's like a certain rate and clip and speed that you're delivering information. How we're making eye contact matters between whether a person feels seen and like a person, like a whole person, or if they feel thinged and objectified in that experience. And when we are asking questions and we're listening for the response, tuning into your mindfulness practice and into your pre grounding in the feet, noticing if you're holding the belly super tight towards the spine, which is what we all do when we're feeling defensive and super stressed out, right? We're kind of like putting on our armor, right? And relaxing the shoulders, connecting to the breath, noticing if you're up here, preparing what you're going to say next, and you're not actually taking in what it is that they say, in those ways, we can become a whole body listener. And that can totally transform the patient clinician interaction. That is a, that's a very concrete example of loving awareness and action of social justice inside of the clinic. Because I guarantee you, when people leave that interaction feeling seen and heard and the experience of compassion and belonging, that's going to bring about a certain nervous system state inside of them that is going to provide immediate benefit and relief to their suffering and discomfort and pain. 
you know, beyond whatever medications or other interventions that you might prescribe in that moment. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. I think simply being with them in a mindful way and asking questions that are targeted at finding out more with an authentic curiosity will enable the healer to get a broader view of where the patient is truly coming from and not just reducing them to their symptoms or like the categorization of what the chief complaint is. Yes. And so as we close, I just wanted to thank you so much, Sarah, for this rich discussion, your open sharing of your story and your expertise. So deep bow of gratitude for you and your work. To learn more about Dr. Sarah King, you can follow her on Instagram at Mind Heart Collective. You can also check out her website at mindheartconsulting.com. Thank you again for joining us, Sarah. Thank you so very much for having me. And, uh, you know, I just kind of want to leave with a, a message of just like really deep gratitude um, because our world is in need of so, so much healing in this moment. And um, I think this podcast um, space that you have created is a space to heal the healers. And that's just so necessary in this moment. So thank you so much for having me. Stay on after the sound of the singing bowl for our mindful moment offering led by Dr. Sarah King. All right. So for those of you who would like to join me in a moment of practice, uh, I would like to invite you to come to a place that feels comfortable and supportive for your practice. I'm personally sitting down in this moment, but you can absolutely do this practice wherever you are, whether you are standing up or maybe it's at the end of a very long day and you're lying down. The invitation here is to gently close the eyes if that feels compassionate. And if you choose not to, you can use what's called a soft gaze. And that's just looking a couple of inches in front of the knees or the feet or whatever area of the body is meeting with the earth. And of course, any of the instructions that I offer up in this practice today are completely optional. Please only do whatever feels most compassionate to you and your body in this moment. And so if you would like, please join me in a few deep breaths to begin our time together. As you're taking those deep inhales and exhales, you may notice a sensation of the body becoming a little bit more anchored to the earth beneath you. And finishing up those deep breaths, whenever you're ready, returning the breath to a natural cadence and rhythm, whatever feels most relaxing. And I invite you to begin by taking the entire body into your mind's eye, just noticing what areas of the body feel most alive to you in this moment. Which areas of your experience of the body are really talking to you right now? So perhaps you're really feeling the presence of one shoulder or another. Maybe it's the bottom of your chin or the top of your head. Maybe it's the muscles on either side of the spine or the right leg or the left leg. simply noticing what is alive in this moment and taking it in. You may begin to notice here the rhythm of your heart, and the rise and fall of the chest.
and maybe you might take one more deep breath in here and begin to send the exhale breath down to the bottoms of the feet. And notice here, there's a subtle difference between the right foot and the left foot. Maybe one feels slightly heavier than the other, or lighter, or tinglier. And after noticing that, you can draw your awareness up the right leg, and then the left leg. Your bottom, wherever it is, perhaps meeting with the chair underneath you and the hips. Just noticing how it is that the bottom part of your body is feeling. And maybe you made a micro adjustment to sit or stand slightly differently when you noticed the bottom half of the body. If there are any thoughts that are running through the mind in this moment, I invite you to just gently notice them going by much like clouds in the sky. And a helpful image can be that you are where you are, seated or lying down on a large grassy field. And there's a vast blue expanse of sky above. And your mind is the sky. And the thoughts are the clouds gently rolling through. And any time that you find yourself getting hooked on a particular thought, you can gently return back to the breath, back to the hill of green grass. And simply allow the thoughts to go by. Here, if you notice that the muscles of your belly are being held tight towards the spine, let's experiment with allowing them to be relaxed and loose. And notice the impact that has on the rest of the body. Maybe there's a softening of the muscles of the chest. Maybe your shoulders relax a little bit more down <clears throat> either side of the spine. And let's take one last deep breath here and direct this breath to the muscles of the face. Notice how the rest of the body responds when you relax the muscles of the chin, the cheeks, the jaw, the muscles behind the eyes and the forehead, even the muscles around the nose. And this is called taking the mask off. And now we'll simply breathe naturally here, taking the entire body into your mind's awareness. And the only thing to do here now is notice the difference between the way you're carrying the energy of your body now and the way your body was when we started this practice. What do you notice?
only when you feel ready. Take one last deep breath here. And begin to very, very slowly open up the eyes at your own pace without staring at a computer monitor or a phone if that's around. Slowly begin to tilt the head and neck upward to gaze upon the ceiling. Taking color and texture into your awareness and rotate the head and the neck to gently look to the left. Very slowly. And when you're ready, rotating the head and neck to look to the right, again, without staring at anything. This is our orienting practice. And if you'd like, you can even turn the body slightly and look behind you at any windows or doors. And then very lastly, you can look down to the ground toward the feet, noticing the pressure of the feet on the earth. And then finally, when you look up, you can notice if there's anything different about the quality of the room or the space you're in right now. It might be very subtle, but you may notice very slight difference. And if you like, you can bring your hand to your heart and the other to your belly and just thank yourself for your practice. Thank you so much, everyone.